So I'd like to talk today about the dollar as a democratic medium. Uh, actually, the first thing I want to do is thank Martha for setting this up and all of you for coming. Um, one way to start this topic is to call to mind a challenge that once confronted the United States. And the issue was how to run a war of liberation, how to marshal the soldiers, the materials, the services that were necessary in that case. Um, as you might have guessed, I'm talking about the Civil War and the problem uh, of mobilizing to fight the Civil War. So the stakes were very high for the United States. They included liberating four million enslaved people, descendants of many million others who had been similarly violated. Uh, but guess how many dollars the United States had in the federal treasury? The United States had three and a half million dollars in the treasury. And the estimates for the immediate cost of the war were 10 times that much. And those, of course, were wildly optimistic estimates. Uh, so the question is, what do you do? How do you buy resources, pay soldiers, mobilize services? So this is what the United States did. This is the greenback. It issued these bills and imposed taxes into the future that were payable in these bills. The famous green back of the green back is here. There were 450 million of these green backs spent into circulation in 1862 and 1863. Uh, and they worked to an astonishing extent. They paid for a critical part of the war. So the last question to think about when we talk about this kind of money is why did it hold value? What happened? The reason it held value is that if you could pay your taxes in a bill as opposed to a coin, then the bill was worth as much as the coin, or in the case of the greenback, almost as much as the coin. It held a great deal of value. Uh, so if we step back and think about this, what we can uh, see is that both in the, its purpose and in its character, this money was a democratic medium. So in its purpose, it was an emancipatory medium. And in its character, it was democratic in the sense that it was based on taxpayer obligation and cooperation. There was another solution that the United States tried out during the war, and it also worked. And here was the, the second solution. You could give people somebody else's IOUs. So in particular, the United States identified a set of banks, which it called, which it denominated the national banks, uh, I'm sorry, so here's, this is the, the logic of the greenback. We're going to come back to this picture. That's wh how they felt, uh, held value. This is the national banknote, and what the United States did was spend these into circulation and tax them out. They were not redeemable in coin during the Civil War. So if you think about this picture and the one I just showed, very much the same logic. So the United States makes a commitment to the national banks. That's the national banking system takes the notes, spends the notes into circulation, and taxes them back out. So uh, coin here is nowhere to be seen. Turns out there wasn't enough coin in circulation to pay for the war in coin or to pay for the war in, in banknotes that were redeemable in coin. So early on in the, in the Civil War, the United States actually tried borrowing from some banks and cashing the banknotes, and it crashed the whole system. So the, the New York City banks in that case lost $13 million in coin within two weeks. So that was the end of that idea. Instead, we went to this kind of thing. Um, and as I said, if you look at the logic, it's very similar to the logic of the greenbacks. These things held value because you could pay your taxes, and for that matter, you could pay for other things, too, in national banknotes. So it turns out that a country can support a banked alternative or a more transparently um, public alternative and make money either way, some people say this is the, the, the national banking system. In many ways, it was the proto-Federal Reserve system of banks. And it was also a democratic medium, right? Emancipatory purpose, basically based on taxpayer obligation. I want to take one more step here. This beautiful image is the picture of a flag of an African-American regiment done by an African-American uh, artist, David Bowser. Um, Mindy Kent did the research for me to find this, um, the history of this image. 
And, um, and it reminds us that the war happily did end. So the, the, the caption says, let soldiers in war be citizens in peace. The, the United States government pulls back its spending, but economic activity booms after the war. Uh, so with the government's permission, the national banking system uh, banks start issuing, or they, can, they, they are given permission to issue national bank notes to private individuals. So notice that the logic is the same. If you're a private person, you give an IOU to the national bank, just the way the US gave a bond to the national bank, and you get national bank notes or you get deposits. And this is actually very much the way commercial banking works. What the commercial banks are doing are amplifying the money supply by making representations of dollars and when people pay back the banks, they're contracting, they're shrinking the money supply. So the idea is that economic activity brings more money supply into circulation and then shrinks the money supply when people pay back the banks. Um, so that was the theory, that is the theory of commercial banking. Notice another thing about this system, especially clear if we look back at this picture. This system of private banking is built on top of the public system, the public platform. So the banks are granted a privilege by the government to make representations of dollars and then to contract them back in. And they do this because it's very profitable to make representations of dollars and bring them back in. Today, 97% of the money supply is made by private banks acting that way and only a very small portion is made, by, is made publicly by the Fed. So just to sum up what we've learned, if you think about the lessons of the Civil War and the monetary problem, money is a publicly defined institution. It's a publicly defined medium. It's an IOU that the government promises to take back. So here, let me go forward. Here's the current dollar. And finally, I was noticing how smooth Bob's presentation was, where those little things appear on the, And I, 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 I aspire to that, but I'm not there yet. Anyway, this circle shows you basically this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, so the same logic as the greenback. Uh, so today, the US uses the banking channel, that's the Fed, the central bank, not the greenback channel to make, uh, to make money. Uh, it puts public debt with the Fed, and that Fed issues dollars or issues reserves to the bank. They're like little atomized pieces of debt. And that money anchors the system. So that's the core. That's what you've heard of high-powered money. The second thing we learned is that commercial banks expand the money supply. They are privileged. They can amplify the money stock by making representations of dollars and then, um, and then contracting them. So multiplying the money, multiplying the dollar is their business model. That's how they work. And it's a very profitable business model. The third thing that we've learned in thinking about the Civil War experience is that money operates for public as well as private purposes. So the money we have today traces its lineage to public purposes. The United States got back into the business of making money after largely ceding it to the states during the 19th century. It gets back into the business of making money because of the need to fight a war of liberation. We can make money for emancipatory purposes, that is, as well as commercial ones. Um, indeed, the, we, the taxpayers, are the anchor of the system. And we can determine the purposes that we make money, the purposes for which we make money democratically. So that might be an emancipatory war. Here's some other reasons to mobilize resources. Education, health care, social welfare, the environment. So I'll close just with um, three suggestions about making money democratically. My first suggestion is that we reset the discourse on the economy. So if you pick up an economics text, as I did the other day to find this quote, it will say, the reason for the universality of money is that it facilitates trade among individuals. So that was James Tobin, could also be Gregory Mankiw or Adam Smith. They're thinking about a world of banks, and they're thinking about the commercial uh, exchange that's facilitated by banks. But money is anchored on a public platform, as we've seen, and it issues for public purposes that will benefit us collectively as well as for private purposes. 
so we can spend money where it's needed and pay for that investment as taxpayers. Public purposes, that is, are not secondary. They're not just administrative. They're not just facilitating private enterprise. They're also essential, productive, and enabling. So we should consider the public goals that are important and apply money to them and apply ourselves to make the money to make them happen. Second suggestion, we should recapture private seniorage. So banks make money on several bases. In part, they take in money from people and lend out that money. But they also profit on the privilege of making money out of representations of dollars, amplifying dollars, making those little credit loops that I showed you on the screen. That's called seniorage. The architects of US finance during the Civil War identified the source of profits that were reaped at that point by state banks. And the Secretary of Treasury, Sam and Chase, said, it's as if the people of the United States made loans without interest to the banks. He went on to say, so when the government reclaims the authority over money, it should transfer the loan that, he made, that it made to the banks, um, representing only the shareholders, to the government, representing the aggregate, aggregate interests of the whole people. So as per Justice Chase, my second suggestion is that we ask the banks and the shadow banks to share the seniorage. Third suggestion is to expand access to credit from money, to a expand access to credit that's created through the production of money. So banks are an ingenious innovation. They tie credit in money to economic activity. So they expand when economic activity expands and they contract uh, when, it, when um, that activity ends. In that way, they tie the effective money supply to profit-driven uh, exchange but exchange doesn't have to be profitable to be worthwhile. According to the ancients, exchange that breaks even is the best exchange of all. So Aristotle wrote about money under the heading of justice in his treatise on ethics. Money, he argued, allowed value to be measured and compared. It enabled people to make deals that were commensurable and therefore fair. So it was about equality, not about profit. So we need to add the wisdom of the ancients, I would say, to current capitalism. We need lending for break-even purposes. Those who aim to break even, to make sustainable lives for themselves, to work for public purposes, not private profit, those people should have access to credit. So what does this mean? It means inclusive banking, postal banking, cooperative banking, development banking, uh, other initiatives that expand the way we distribute access to credit. So I'll close with an exhortation. We often think about money in politics. We've treated this as a problem, and I agree. Citizens United is a disaster. Uh, money undermines effective equality of influence uh, when it affects political campaigns. But money can also be democratic, and we have to step back and recover its public nature and put it to work in ways that build strong, emancipatory communities.